May I now invite on stage Dr. Masood Mohammad, Senior Consultant, Intensivist, Care Hospital to address our audience on the topic Chronic Respiratory Diseases and Pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, the High Tech uh, Convention Center. And uh, thanks, Dr. Rangal uh, Digaru, for uh, giving this opportunity to speak. Yeah, just I'm going to talk about uh, the chronic respiratory diseases in pandemic, especially everyone knows that we're going to talk more about COVID and related that. So what are the chronic respiratory diseases? So they are the diseases of the airway and the other structures of the lung. They are not curable. This is very important for us. It is not like something like a tuberculosis or something like that. So, but, but we treat them so that we can improve their sharpness of breath and their quality of life, their functional quality of life. And with the WHO guard, their vision is just to make the people free, um, breath freely, and the aim is to reduce the morbidity and mortality and premature deaths. And these are the, some of, these are the, uh, the chronic lung diseases mentioned by uh, the WHO. They include asthma, bronchiectasis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, COPD, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary embolism, and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I think uh, this is no need for me to tell what is the endemic outbreak pandemic, just to complete the picture. We know that the pandemic is a health condition that has spread globally, which we are now in. And historically, there are pandemics have been happening uh, before Christ uh, era. Uh, and the biggest pandemic, if you see, the black death, 200 million deaths happened. There are many reasons for this or that. The reason is that there are no diagnostic facilities and there is no treatment facilities or other processes that we have now. And we all know about the Spanish flu. In the Spanish flu in the, in the 20th, early of the 20th century. Uh, where we lost 50 million deaths. Uh, uh, we know that it is uh, basically the USA. Uh, they, that, that time people used to uh, hide things. That's the main thing. The difference between that time to this time is people did not why the Spanish flu has come. It has come because it is not that everyone thinks that it has originated in Spain. No, it was originated in USA because that time the world war was going on. So they wanted to hide a lot of troops, and uh, most of the people are young who died. And the Spain is the first country which um, uh, it, which has declared that it has a flu. That's where the name had come, but actually it has originated from the states. Then our famous uh, swine flu in 2009, H1N1. Uh, then now we are going through the COVID, where almost all we lost around five million people. Um, with a case fatality rate of around four, I think more than 250 million were affected globally. I, I think everyone knows about that. I'm not going to, yeah. So before I go for the pulmonary, uh, I think uh, everyone is talking about that. So I don't go much. We all know that the Kasasco, it comes from the uh, reassortment of the virus from the bats as well as from the Pangolian. And then once it enters into the body through AC inhibitors, the root of entry is through AC inhibitors, the spike protein, which attaches there. And then depending upon the immunity, either they recover or they die with the ARDS and multi-organ failure. Uh, this pathophysiology is very important for us. Is, uh, I'll take a couple of minutes here. Uh, when there is no infection in our body, we do have a angiotensin converting enzyme receptor too. So what this does is, whenever uh, anything attaches and it is activated, it is in check. What happens is, it is it converts into angiotensin 1 to 7, and these are like anti-inflammatory mediators, they cause vasodilatation, and they protect our body. And when there is infection happens, we all know that virus enters into the body through angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Once it enters, so it converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, more of it is released, angiotensin 1 is released, which is more inflammatory. It causes the capillary leak, vasoconstriction, and there's a lot of edema and a lot of inflammatory markers, and it leads slowly to systemic inflammatory response, multi-organ failure, and death. And while during this process, what happens is most of the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors they are lost. They are either they shed away during infection 
are the internal lyse. So we lose the, most of the angiotensin converting enzymes. And what is a risk factor? There are, I'm not going to put any papers here. The reason being is that I think the world hasn't seen the number of papers published in these uh, one, and one, uh, one year or a couple of years. Thousands, thousands of papers. Recently we sent an article on uh, um, uh, this um, uh, COVID. They said they were overwhelmed. They don't want to publish any COVID patients. They wanted to publish other than COVID patients. So I'm not going to put the papers, just I'm going to put the essence of these papers. So what is the risk factors? We know that. So what is the evidence of that? So the evidence is that age is the biggest risk factor, more than 65 years, unlike other pandemic. In H1N1, if you see, uh, the, it was mainly the middle-aged uh, patients, uh, the young and middle-aged uh, patients who are affected more and lost lives. Yeah, the same with the MERS-CO as well. And uh, H1N1, this uh, the sp famous uh, Spanish flu as well. Young, young military people died in those days. Whereas risk factors in the COVID, age is the number one, followed by your obesity. So almost 68% like of the patients who had obesity, they died. The fatality rate is very high in them. And uh, because we are talking about the lung, chronic pulmonary, COPD is also is, is one of the risk factors. Risk factor for infection, 52% of risk factor, as well as the risk of death. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the chronic non-infectious respiratory pathologies. I'm going to talk mainly about the obstructive sleep apnea, COPD, asthma, bronchiectasis, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary vascular disease, and lung cancer. Coming to the obstructive sleep apnea, it is the most common disease of chronic pulmonary diseases. And uh, the risk factors for that are age, male gender, and obesity. And all these three things are risk factors for COVID-19 as well. And it has been found from the meta-analysis, I'm not talking about the single papers, for the meta-analysis and different papers which I have quoted there, it has shown that the odds ratio of death with SARS-CoV-2 has gone up to 1.65, hospitalization, the respiratory failure, and uh, their cortical, uh, the, the critical illness, ICU admissions, as well as the mortalities related to COVID. So how does it happen? So why the obstructive sleep apnea patients? We see whenever we are talking about something, we should know why it is happening. The pathophysiology is important because obstructive sleep apnea, because of their obesity, they already have some inflammatory inflammation which is ongoing in their body and also airways. And because of this, the renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone mechanism, it has dysregulated and it releases um, uh, complements. And this causes systemic inflammatory response and it causes further hypoxemia worsens. So when this happens, when it uh, goes, when these patients are attacked with COVID, which has similar pathophysiology, their oxygenation, uh, most, most of the times it becomes worsened, they become severely hypoxemic and they usually die. And one interesting thing is in both obstructive sleep apnea as well as in COVID-19, there is an endothelial dysfunction and this causes thromboembolic diseases and we all know that the, most of the patients of these, they, they die because of pulmonary embolism or acute MIs or acute CVAs. So, and this is a, like the additional effect of COVID as well as obstructive sleep apnea. The lung, to, I'm sorry for that arrow, uh, I think it was some little bit type error. So the lung, it, and from the meta-analysis again, it has said that it is not the hypoxemia itself which is causing death of these obese patients, obstructive sleep apnea patients. It is basically the long-term consequences of obstructive sleep apnea which is causing death when they get affected with your COVID. So how do you manage? We all know that polysomnography, the sleep study, conventionally they used to do in sleep labs is the gold standard technique. Obviously, you cannot do it because of your know, infection and spread and other things. Uh, uh, so what now they, they are starting is most of the people, if you talk to them, they can come to your house and they can keep your, uh, they can do the sleep study. So, but you have to select the patient. Don't do it for all patients, just the highly selected patients because the person who is coming, he is also prone to get infection. So highly selected patients, we do sleep studies at home and then we manage them. Suppose we find a mild, sleep apnea. Usually before we used to do something like that, the figure which I have shown is a mandibular advanced device which we keep in the mouth. But 
they are discouraging because the person who goes and demonstrates is very close to him and he may be exposed to the aerosols and infection unless our, otherwise it requires it has to be used. And another thing is to be remembered is for the carers who are giving this, they should know that the virus is viable on this device for three days. For a mild to moderate cases and moderate to severe cases, we go for CPAP or non-invasive ventilation, which is a portable. That also we should keep in mind, it generates aerosols. So we should keep the people who are near to him, they should be um, uh, alarmed that they should take care of these aerosols. And all surgical procedures, in severe cases, we know that we go for surgical procedures and we should be postponed. So this is about our obstetric sleep apnea. Next disease is COPD. We know that chronic obstetric pulmonary diseases which come as about chronic bronchitis as well as uh, emphysema. So the prevalences uh, from different papers, different prevalences have been uh, um, uh, noted. Well, it, it ranges from 0 to 10 percent and it requires ICU. The people who are in ICU, the COPD patients, they are like 4 to 38 percent of them. And in meta-analysis, it had shown that there is a three times death of these patients in ICUs, patients who are on mechanical ventilator, needing of mechanical ventilator is three times, as well as the requirement of ICU admissions is three times. How do you manage them? So actually there is no expert opinion because there is no, it is a way, it is rapidly it had come, so there is no time for us to go in detail about uh, um, uh, evidence base. So whatever the goal, we know that the, the global initiative for chronic obstetric lung disease, it is the one which dictates the COP patients in the world. So what it had said is, just don't do PFTs. So what we know clearly is that uh, the PFTs all were stopped during this pandemic. The, you know that PFT means we have to blow on a machine. So take deep breath and blow as much as possible. We all know that this virus is through the aerosol um, generation. So they stopped performing um, um, pulmonary function tests for the diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Also, they reduced the bronchoscopies and surgeries as much as possible unless until it is needed. For example, a patient had come and uh, he had a um, COPD or something else, some other lung disease and he is bleeding inside. We don't know what is ca causing that. That time we we'll do go, we do go bronchoscopy or uh, digit bronchoscopy, we find out we need, it is a life threatening and sometimes we don't know what is happening there, we need to do bronchial lavage patient is in ICU or ventilator, he is not, not getting treated with your antibiotics, so we need to do brawl, we need to do life-saving, we can do it provided it is life-saving, otherwise avoid it. For example, we want you to do it, what usually we do is do a um, uh, rapid antigen test or negative RT-PCR, once it comes negative then we can go, when you are doing that you do a basic infection control measures like using uh, your respirator, PPEs, everything you should do. Coming to the treatment, People have, many people said steroids. Initially, when you take the uh, previous viral, like influenza virus, there is, uh, uh, they used to say, uh, don't use steroids, because steroids increase the viral replication. However, in this COVID, in this past one and a half year to two years, there is no evidence that using this was uh, Sama, Lama, I mean, short acting, bit agonist, short acting, you were, um, um, you know, muscularic antagonists, long-acting, short-acting, there's no risk of that. And therefore, the patient is there, who is acute infective exacerbation of COPD comes to you. So use your antibiotics as you were using before, as well as steroids. Here, there is no need to stop them thinking that the patient has a COVID and then he will exacerbate. This is the one difference I wanted to tell you. You should you start treat them as you were treating them before. Coming to the inhaled corticosteroids, there is a lot of literature on inhaled corticosteroids because nowadays if you think of bronchial asthma, GINA guidelines, everyone tells inhaled corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment for the bronchial asthmatics, not like before. Before people used to think don't use inhaled corticosteroids, use your uh, beta agonies. But now inhaled corticosteroids is a mainstay of treatment and it has been found that it is a protective in fact. Because what they found is, we all know that to enter the virus into the body, we need AC2 inhibitors. And it has been shown, people who have been on inhaled corticosteroids, their sputum samples of AC2 receptors, as well as patients who are, they did bronchoalveolar samplings, their AC2 receptors were very, very low. So this prevents the uh, virus to go in and they have less incidence of infection. 
but we should avoid nebulizers. So most of the people, like especially elderly, who cannot take their uh, uh, MDIs, uh, they be, they, if you see that they are at home sun nebulizers, because nebulizers, it has shown that it can spread up to one meter, the aerosol spread will be there. So if the patient is sick and patient is infected, maybe asymptomatic, we don't know, and if you put a nebulizer for this patient, so there's a high chance that it will spread by aerosol. So we should avoid nebulizers. So what should we use? So we should uh, replace them with MDIs, MDIs with your spacer, which is equivalently good, and, uh, uh, and then use dry powders or soft mist inhalers, and um, go for uh, uh, non inflammatory uh, therapies like uh, vaccinate them, not about corona vaccine itself, along with that, your annual influenza vaccination, and rehabilitation, which is a home rehabilitation. Before, people used to come and do rehabilitation at home, but now people are using the help of telemedicine. So what they do is they don't come physically, they will communicate with them, they will see on phones or on videos, on, um, um, on laptops, that uh, they will tell them how to do that. So this is called as a telemedicine. Telemedicine is famous basically in intensive care where there are no consultants, but it can be managed from one country to another country as well. For example, there is in Australia it is the day. Uh, 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 it is night, and USA it is day. So people from uh, USA, they can manage the ICUs um, in uh, Australia, and it has been happening from almost uh, a, a decade. People have been doing it, telemedicine. It is in a way that it is more con convenient as well as comfortable. Uh, so this uh, telemedicine concept has come now, and it is, it is uh, more in use now uh, in all aspects. So this is how the uh, inter um, inhaled corticosteroids work. So as I said, the AC inhibitors, AC2 receptors are there. So what the steroids does is, it stops the proliferation of virus, as well as it causes something like type 2 inflammation in which, and it prevents the exacerbation of your COVID. But the drawback of that is that it causes some immunosuppression as well. Don't forget that it is a steroid. So it causes second bacterial infection, and then it causes some pneumonia, and we may lose patients. But overall, when you take the, um, the benefit of using inhaled corticosteroids is very, very high compared to the drawback of getting infections. So people who are on inhaled corticosteroids, let them continue using inhaled corticosteroids. And um, um, this is the uh, same I said, the gold guidelines for the COPD patients. What they did is they have given a beautiful picture. Suppose the patient is um, non-infective. Continue as as he was. Patient may be having uh, some cough or shortness of breath. Don't think that it is a COVID, but you should have, have keep a uh, low threshold for testing it. Treat them at home. If it is a mild case, treat them at home. If it is like a moderate to sick cases, bring them to the hospital. Give oxygen to them. And uh, uh, if the patient is hypoxemic, you should give um, uh, just oxygen supplementation. Don't worry that. Uh, I think the medical background people, they know that if it is a COPD, we should not give oxygen to them. No, it's a strong concept. We should give to the oxygen to keep a certain level of oxygenation, not like 97, 98% of saturation. We should keep them 88 to 92% of the saturation we need them. And uh, the patient is like retaining carbon dioxide, then we should go for your NIV, uh, um, and then if further deteriorates, ventilate them, and uh, you need to go for further uh, advanced technologies. Once they recover, then we need to have rehabilitation, as I said before, pulmonary rehabilitation. It can be done at home uh, with a telemedicine help. Coming to the medications commonly used, as uh, uh, before um, 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 the endocrinologist had said, that uh, there are so many medications are there. Some of them are useful, some of them have not shown any usefulness. Despite that, there is no contraindication of using any of them. Like you can use your remdesivir, your tyrosinogenase inhibitors like bacitinib, corticosteroids, systemic corticosteroids, anti interleukin 6 receptor antagonists like your tocilizumab or convulsant plasma. All these things you can use it. Coming to the hypoxemia, as I said, we use oxygen. If it's hypercapnia, you use uh, um, uh, non visual ventilation. So, this is about the COPD patients. Coming to the asthma patients. Asthma patients, the prevalence is same as in the general asthma, but what they found is, interestingly, the whole pandemic era, the asthma incidence has come down. The admissions, the exacerbations, everything has come down. That is interesting. So they found the cause for that is because of the lockdown effects, 
and most of the them, people they stayed at home. So there was no pollution, they are really clean air, and there is no cross contamination. The, the uh, uh, infection with influenza was less. So the um, and this one. Number two is there's something that is a shielding effect. For patients who are like COPD, asthma, uh, everyone is telling them to stay at home, take care of your um, health, and also uh, the prescription. Especially in Scotland and England, there were nice studies they have done. They found their inhaled corticosteroid prescription has gone up like more than ten times than before. So all these things led to the reduced incidence of asthma, admitting to exacerbations to the ED or to the hospital admissions. Coming to asthma itself, unlike your COPD, we have seen that COPD patients, they have high risk of hospital admissions and death. But asthma patients, they have very good prognosis. This is really interesting. Especially there is a one type of, there is a different morphologies of asthma are there. One type is uh, type 2 uh, phenotype, high phenotype, where they have high eosinophils. So if a patient has a high eosinophilic asthma, they are, they have very, they are protected to COVID. That's really interesting to see that because Again, these patients, when they found, they have used uh, in, uh, inhaled corticosteroids as well, and their uh, ACE2 receptor levels from the sputum as well as from the uh, bronchial lavage samples, they are very less. So they are protected there. That's really interesting. So these patients, the second thing is these patients are on inhaled corticosteroids, that's also protective. But the poor prognosis are comorbidities, like the patient is elderly, asthmatic, patient has a diabetes or uh, some other immunocompromised status and the patient is step 2 low phenotype means the eosinophils are less than 150 or 100 very as low as they are uh, the more uh, sick they are to succumb to covid and the patient who are on oral corticosteroids and severe asthma patients are oral corticosteroids it means that they are very very severe asthmatics people usually they are not on oral corticosteroids usually they are on inhaled corticosteroids so a patient is an oral corticosteroid means it's what it is a severe asthma and they are very high risk and the outcomes are very poor if they get infection of the corticosteroids coming to the monoclonal antibodies in bronchial asthma nowadays we have step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4, step 5 treatments. Step 1 means initially you start with step 1 called mild asthma. You progress if it is not controlled to a stage of step 2, 5. Step 5 means when the patient is in already on 3 triple therapy and uh, he is not responding, then we go for monoclonal antibodies. Of course, they are very, very expensive in India, but uh, um, uh, mepolizumab and resilizumab, very few pharmacologists do use them. Resilizumab is not available yet in India, but uh, you have, mepolizumab is available, but very, very expensive. So only people who can afford it, they are using. But in the West, where the health is uh, free, like in NHS, uh, UK, um, so you, it's freely available and people have been using, they, they have very good improvement on that. So. When we think of monoclonal antibodies, it goes immediately to that, oh, can I use it for the patients who have, um, because the monoclonal antibodies, it reduces your immunity, and you are dealing with the COVID. So can I use it? Yes. So they have found that there is no increased risk of infection, severity, or mortality among patients with COVID who have been using a monoclonal antibodies. Uh, of course, it is protective because you are optimizing asthma, you are preventing these asthmatics to go to the hospitals. By that, you are exposing them to interact with the other COVID patients, and you are preventing or reducing the risk of them and reducing the infection. So, indirectly, it is helpful. So, there is a uh, European Academy of Allergy and uh, Clinical Immunology. These are the people who dictate the you know, this monoclonal antibodies for asthmatics or allergics. So, they have given a position paper which have give, which they said if the patient has no infection if the patient is on these monoclonal antibodies you continue those monoclonal antibodies however if the patient is proven that he has been infected it is to it is a mild disease or severe disease you have to stop them till what time you have to stop them you have to stop them at least for two weeks till two weeks after your negative rt pcr result and then meanwhile you have to continue your other medications so that is about the asthma. So we have seen obstructive sleep apnea, which is the worst. COPD, which also is a very risk factor for the COVID, as well as the outcome mortalities are very bad. Whereas asthmatics, they are particularly, in fact, a particular type of type 2 phenotypes. What about bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis is not a COPD. Remember, 
bronchiectasis is a structural abnormality of the lungs. So there are two types of bronchiectasis. One is cystic fibrosis, one is non-cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis usually is a mutation in the genes where it is usually childhood. Usually people that don't live up to like 30 years. 30 years is the maximum life. Usually they die between 12 to 13 years because of repeated infections. Their airways are dilated, they are damaged, repeated infections they will get. There's some problem with your transfer of the proteins of sodium and uh, water electrolytes and all those things and uh, yeah they don't leave uh, so coming to the non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis these people they get the bronchiectasis because of some infections usually usually tuberculosis so when the tuberculosis affects it causes permanent damage usually you see these patients little bit elderly uh, so what is the uh, the impact of covid on these patients so severe covid was significantly higher in bronchiectasis you can see the numbers 30 patients who had a covid uh, bronchiectasis the covid is 30 percent severe covid incidence is 30 per 30 percent when compared to the non-covid patients and they require more oxygen supplementation they go more ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. I think this is the last rescue therapy. When I fail to ventilate my patient, I am giving the maximum from my mechanical ventilation. Despite that the patient is dying, then I go for ECMO. ECMO means what? They put cannulas in the blood, they take the blood out, they oxygenate it, and then they send it back through the pump. That is called as ECMO. So even these people, bronchitis patients, they require more ECMO support, and their mortality is very high, which is statistically significant. Coming to the cystic fibrosis, this is also another surprising to see uh, that cystic fibrosis is more protective. They have found that there is no difference between a person who had a cystic fibrosis and who did not have a cystic, uh, who had a non-cystic fibrosis patient who got the infection with the your COVID. The reason is, again, the same AC2 inhibitors, because there are a lot of mutations in cystic fibrosis patients. The patients who have cystic fibrosis, their uh, AC2 inhibitor levels are very low, and uh, the, the, uh, the TNF is a membrane, transmembrane. It allows the virus to enter into the and uh, replicate. These two things are low in cystic fibrosis patients. And also, as I said to you before, because of their um, uh, mutations, they, they think their lung secretions are very, very thick because they lose a lot of water and uh, most of their alveoli, are, the, the areas are damaged and they're distended. So most of the times they are colonized by some bacteria, usually pseudomonas. So they say this could be a protective for the viral infection. So these are the two explanations they give. So to conclude that, um, patients who have a cystic fibrosis, they are protective or they are not like they, they will not cause any worse outcomes when they get with COVID. Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease, they are a, a group of diseases where there are different types of their acute, chronic, uh, almost six to seven are there. So what happens is there, there is a interstitial means there is fibrosis like picture is there. So the most of the lung is getting involved into that. They are usually, usually when a patient comes with interstitial lung disease to give a certain extent, their treatment is lung transplant. Otherwise, we lose them. So what is their stand? Usually, these patients, for to a certain extent, we use heavy medications like uh, um, immunotherapy medications, like um, uh, corticosteroids initially, followed by we go for uh, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and all these uh, immunosuppressive uh, medications, we use them. And also we use them antifibrotic therapy. It means there are some treatments that are available like nintanabin and pelfinidone, which reduces, they will not halt, but they will reduce the speed of progression of the interstitial lung disease. So these two medications are there. So the advice is that people who are on these medications, let them continue the same medications even during the pandemic and don't stop them. That is, if you stop them, they go into their exacerbations, and then they go to the hospitals, they acquire infections, and then they, uh, and this is a vicious cycle. Uh, however, uh, the interstitial lung disease, in general, they have poor prognosis once they come to the hospital, and it has proven the same when the patient gets COVID, their outcomes are very, very poor. Coming to the vascular diseases, we all know that, I think everyone is talking that this uh, coronavirus is COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is notorious for um, uh, clots. So what it does is it causes some endothelial damage and then it causes clot formations. Uh, it has been shown that there are two things, permeabilism and DVT. 
So DVT usually, usually from the embolism comes from the lower limbs, right? So they have found that in a meta-analysis that the, all the pool data they found when compared to see here, it is 7% um, uh, in the COVID patients, whereas it's 0.2% in the non-COVID patients, the pulmonary embolism, the same populations, and it's significant. Whereas if you come down, DVT almost all the same in both populations. So they found that it is not the DVT per se which is causing pulmonary embolism, it is the pathology in the lungs itself where itself they are causing microclots, and it has been proven by apopsis as well because they found wherever there is a consolidation, wherever there is a lung lesion, next to it they have the clots. So it is basically the pulmonary embolism second to vascular um, uh, damage and it is a famous Verkhoff triad for pulmonary thromboembolism for the clot to form, uh, this is called the Verkhoff Wichos triad. It has uh, three things, one is to form a clot, we need to have three things. One is you should have a stasis of the blood, means blood flow should be reduced, which is happening in them because of your platelet aggregation and other things. And there must be some endothelial injury to activate your clotting system. And the third is your coagulopathy. All these three things are happening once the co coronavirus enters into the system through your AC2 receptors. So what is the stance about the internal guidelines? So this um, International Society on Thrombosis and uh, Hemostasis, the guidelines, they said if the patient is diagnosed to have a clot, during his hospital admission, when you discharge them, use for three months the anticoagulation. If he doesn't have any clot, use the prophylaxis for two to six weeks. So I think if any one of our relatives who knows who goes to the hospital, they discharge, they are usually kept up to six weeks sometimes, your prophylactic doses of uh, oral anticoagulants nowadays. Coming to the lung cancer, there was a systemic review and it has shown that this is a uh, forest plot uh, it, what it does is it takes all the studies and then it compares and they found that patients who have a lung cancer compared to the all other cancers, they are um, a tendency to die twice more than those who have a no cancer, uh, all other cancers. So it means the patients have lung cancer, they have the tendency to die compared to other cancers. And they are classified as a, most common is a non-small cell carcinoma, usually they are stage 4. And they, uh, management wise, they um, uh, categorize into tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. Depending upon that, they started to triage them and then treat them. Because tier 1 means they are very, very unstable, high priority basis. Tier 3 is the low priority basis. Uh, these patients usually, uh, they need surgery, definitely, right? So when there is a lung cancer, some of them are non operable, some of them are operable. People who are operable, usually surgical resection is delayed 2 to 3 weeks post recovery of the um, um, corona. Uh, meanwhile, they can go for stereotactic radiotherapy. They can use some oral it, um, um, medications like uh, oral etoposite. And uh, this is, uh, uh, usually we go for multidisciplinary, not one person. The multidisciplinary team approach is very, very important. So all the treat, uh, for example, patient has a lung cancer, everyone is getting involved, pulmonologist, your oncologist, surgical oncologist, and um, um, the physiotherapy, everyone gets involved, and they plan for the treatment, what to do, what to do, is it acceptable or not, and radiotherapy as well. Um, but after that, end of that, we will go for rehabilitation, telemedicine uh, is very important. For, for a good telemedicine to have, we need to have a good um, um, IT infrastructure, and we need to provision of um, tele-rehabilitation, but real-time um, videos and audios must be available, which are high quality. And if it is that's easy to do it and easy to prevent your uh, infection spread. So I conclude, it's a small lecture. I conclude that uh, we all know that uh, these pulmonologists are, the, um, um, uh, they are uh, there who are very high risk because they are the people who are treating them. So they have to uh, adopt their clinical activities to these new situations like uh, doing the telemedicine or communicating, calling them because the physical contact is very important and we cannot do your uh, PFTs. So they should uh, choose which patient they have to do PFTs, they have to do PFTs for them, otherwise avoid as much as possible and uh, do tele conferences and, um, um, uh, and they have to adapt themselves. Coming to lung diseases wise, as I said, except asthma, all of the diseases are very, very high risk for getting a severe COVID, as well as once they get the COVID, their outcomes are very poor. 
and uh, asthma type 2 as well as uh, cystic fibrosis, they are protected against this. If the patient is on any therapeutic, whatever he has taken before COVID, he has to continue them. There is nothing to stop. He has to continue, except once he gets COVID, he has to stop his monoclonal antibodies. And we need a multidisciplinary approach and a utilized telemedicine for management of rehabilitation. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nasser. Thank you, sir. May I now invite on stage Dr. Lakshmi Lavanya Alapati, endocrinologist, managing director, American Institute of Diabetes and Endocrinology, to please, pre to please present a memento to Dr. Masood Mohammed, senior consultant, intensivist, Care Hospital. Can we have a huge round of applause, everyone? Thank you.